Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, my name's Kent Coleman. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, my dry date is May 18th, 1992. And uh, I want to, first of all, thank Ralph for asking me to participate uh, in, in such a wonderful event that uh, he put together. Uh, it is always an honor and a privilege to participate. Uh, in anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you know, I've been asked to talk about step one this morning, and, and I don't script talks. You know, you know the, the, the first part of your, your talk, if you talk about your, your drinking history, that doesn't change unless you drink again, right? So I haven't drank again. So even though you may talk about different things at different times, um, that doesn't change. Um, what changes is what's going on now and, and how I see things differently. Um, this morning, it, it occurred to me that like this life that I have now, um, as a result of having taken this first step. Now, obviously, there's 11 more that follow it. But. As Bill Wilson said, you know, this is the one that's the 100 percenter. The other 11, you do the best you can on a daily basis, and hopefully you get progressively better in implementing those principles um, in my life. But step one is the one where there's no compromise. And, um, and, and here's the thing, like, I have a great respect for alcoholism. Um, I have seen people um, who came in here, and and as alcoholism is described in this book, you know, when you hear one of us talk, you know, game recognizes game, right? You just like, oh yeah, right, and and everything in the book that you know describes alcoholism, they describe to a T, and then at some point they fail to enlarge their spiritual condition and they drink again. And I've had the opportunity to not only sponsor some of those people, but just because I knew them to talk with them. Um, and I always ask them a question like, are you alcoholic? Yes. Well, before you took that drink, did any of the things that you knew about alcoholism and what qualified you to be an alcoholic occur to you? And the answer has been no, 100% of the time. Such is the cunning, baffling, and powerful nature of this thing. So when I talk about step one, I'm going to talk about how I, I got to that point um, of what Bill Wilson calls, you know, utter defeat. And I'll talk about that. But I need to be reminded, um, and oftentimes I am, that uh, this, is, this is a daily, daily program. And it's what I do today, not what I did before. It's not what I know. It's not who I know. It's what I do today that is important. The life that I have today, um, my girlfriend, Janelle, my daughters, Alyssa and Jordan, my granddaughter, Caroline, um, my brother, my family and friends, you know, the wonderful job that I, all of this, trust me. Without step one, all that's gone. And my experience has been, see, because no human power can relieve my alcoholism. Janelle will not be able to stop me from drinking. Janelle, she a member of this fellowship. She'd be out of here in New York minute if I start drinking. And I, I wouldn't blame her. But my children, my granddaughter, right? it'd be gone. It'd be gone because I drink to the exclusion of life. 
I drink to the exclusion of life. I have an obsession that is so powerful that it will justify the taking of the first drink, no matter what the potential consequences, no matter what I know, no matter what I don't want to happen, no human power. No human power. I need to remember that. I've always said that alcoholism is, is you know, people say it's a disease of denial. I've always said it's a disease of ignorance. Uh, nowhere that I went to school from kindergarten to graduating from college did we discuss the disease concept of alcoholism. It was not, I had no clue as to what alcoholism was. If you'd have asked me the day I walked into treatment, if I was alcoholic, my answer would have been no. And that wasn't because you know, like I really didn't think I didn't know what it was. I got to I got to get honest here. I didn't know what it was. I had absolutely no idea. No, I used to tell a guy at work, we'd be standing at the time clock, man, I've been thinking about a drink all night. He didn't look at me and go, that's the mental obsession that precedes the first. We didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know what it was. Right. So so for me, it's a disease of ignorance. I can't I can't deny something until I know the truth. Once I know the truth, then it's a different story. And I never knew the truth, right? And and this thing, this 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 cunning, baffling, and powerful thing. Bill Wilson made a statement in a story about his spiritual experience, and he talked about God, and he said his impact on me was sudden and profound, and and the impact of alcohol on me would fit that description. It was sudden, and it was profound. I, I grew up in a family that uh. There's a lot of alcoholism on both sides. No one knew that. I mean, nobody called anybody that. I never heard anybody in my family called alcoholic. Um, those people were talked about in hushed, hushed tones, right? And poor Ed, poor Sam, poor, you know, and it was like that. And um, like nobody really understood it. We there were a lot of people who died as a direct result uh, of drinking, uh, you know, cirrhosis of the liver, car accidents, drunk, um, you know, a lot of things that happened, suicides that I know today were the direct byproduct of untreated alcoholism. But we we didn't know that. So there was a lot of drinking in my family. Um, so when we were young, we were warned. Um, to stay away from it. Don't don't drink. Um, as you can tell, people in our family don't do alcohol well. Um, and so there's a lot of a lot of examples that, you know, they would cite. And, and you know, growing up as a kid, it wasn't on my mind. I was a normal kid. Um, we had a really good upbringing. Uh, we wasn't uh, sent to church. We was taken to church. Um, all of the spiritual principles that I've learned about uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, when I got here, um, I knew them all. Um, not only did I know them, I had seen them in action. Um, so it was nothing new. Um, spiritual living, I always say, did not originate in Akron in 1935. Those principles are ancient. And there's a lot of people who live like that every single day. And as my first sponsor used to say, they don't expect a pat on the back for it either. Um, but, you know, growing up, uh, uh, alcohol was not an issue in my life um, until I was 14 years old. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing because everybody's different. Um, when I said its impact on me was sudden and profound, um, Bill also said, he said, God comes to most men gradually. And sometimes alcoholism develops in people gradually over time. Some people drink successfully or socially for some period of time before they cross that invisible line. I was not one of those people. Uh, I'm 14 years old and I get in a car with a guy. Um, and it's at a time in my life when, um, I've, I've always been uh, a person who was shy and, and insecure, um, afraid. Let's just let's just cut to the chase. The real the real problem. Um, I've always been riddled by fear um, and uncomfortable around people, uncomfortable uh, with my life 
just never felt like anything was enough. Um, my mother used to say that you could not give Kenny enough. You can't give him enough, um, no matter what it is. And I can remember being 13 years old. Um, I wanted this 10 speed. It was at Palmerson's bicycle shop. It used to be over on Hayes Avenue. Good Lord. Uh, and, uh, it was in the window and I wanted that 10 speed. And I used to daydream about having that 10 speed. I would be the king of the neighborhood. I was going to ride around the neighborhood, ride it, right? Go like, oh, yeah, there you go. You got it going on, right? Always something outside of me, right? I'm looking for to fix whatever this, this feeling of uneasiness, this feeling of, of apartness that I always had. And I, I can't remember a time I didn't have that. Don't know why. I don't care why. I just tell you that's how it was. And uh, so I got the 10 speed on my birthday. Uh, I had that kind of mom and dad. They they did the best they could, not only to see to it that we had what we needed, but most of the things that we wanted, we were, we were very blessed. And uh, I rode that 10 speed around the block a couple of times. Nobody paid me no attention, right? And, uh, you know, I came back and I laid it down in the front yard and I walked in the door. And my mother was sitting on the couch and I looked at my mother and I said, that's all right, but I really want a mini bike. I really want something with an engine on it, right? And that's th that is the story of my life. I'm a next thing kind of guy. It's always the next thing, the next place. Uh, the next award, the next recognition, um, that's going to make it better. I've never been comfortable in the day that I'm in, in, in the skin that I'm in, never. And I got in the car with a guy. And most of my life has lived in my head. I don't live in the real world with the rest of you. And, uh, you know, this is a guy whose life I lived in my head. You know, the snazzy car. Uh, Johnny had this, this uh, it was a Pontiac. Um, baskets and spinners, quarter walls, um, music you could hear for six blocks. Uh, Johnny was the captain of the basketball team. Um, and, and he was a guy who was respected, you know, in the street. And he just, you know, and, and I'm with Johnny. And he was my best friend's older brother. And uh, we all played basketball together in the mid, mid to late 70s at Sandusky High. I got in the car with Johnny and I said, hey, man, you know, what's going on? He said, you want to get something to drink? Now, you know, all of the warnings that I had received about drinking, that didn't, that didn't come to me because that ain't going to happen to me anyway, right? My focus is I want to be like him, right? I'm looking. So, yeah, I, I, I was addicted to acceptance way before. I picked up a drink of alcohol. If he would have said, let's go rob the carry out, I guarantee you, I, I would have done it. And uh, we went through there and we bought 10 quarts of Slith's Malt Liquor Bull. And uh, the reason we bought it in Slith's Malt Liquor Bull, because it was on sale. The guy said, more bang for your buck. And uh, we bought them 10 quarts. He put them in brown paper sacks. We put, set them in the back seat, dropped the convertible top on that car, and we rode through the streets of Sandusky and we started drinking. To this day, it is difficult to describe uh, what that did. Almost instantaneously, the music got clearer, the sky got bluer. Um, but something happened inside me, and I look back at it now, and, and what I realized, it, it was the dissipation of fear. All of a sudden, I ain't afraid anymore. All of a sudden, I'm running my mouth. All of a sudden, I'm saying, let's go here. Let's go do this. We went behind the Derrick Apartments. That's over on the south side. Uh, that's my side. Uh -huh. And Sandusky, we got the south side and the east side. I ain't going to get into all that. I'm a south sider. And uh, we, uh, we pulled up behind the Derricks and the fellas surrounded the car. Convertible top is down. Parliament Funkadelic is blasting. And, uh, and I looked at Johnny. I said, man, turn that music down. I said, because I, I want to tell a few people here a few things. I've been wanting to tell them for quite a while. And Johnny turned the music down, and I went around that circle of hoodlums that was out there and told every one of them what I thought of them. 
and what they needed to do, in my opinion, to improve themselves. The reaction of the guys around that car, I could I can sum it up for you in one word. Uh, and that word is acceptance. Dudes was leaning in the car in the convertible, hugging me. He said, see, I told you. I told you, Coleman, all right. One of the fellas, he loosening up. Now, trust me, I ain't said five words in public in the last three years. And now my mouth is running like a sewing machine. And dudes is hugging me. And that's Coleman, all right. One of the fellas, he's loosening up. He's doing a little drinking. I connected a dot. When I drink, there is a positive change. There is a positive change. You know, the rest of that day uh, was filled with the same things. I talked to girls and and we rode around and and we pulled up the street corners and people came and talked. And it was just it, it was an unbelievable experience. And I always say that my first drunk is really a, a microism of the rest of my drinking story. If you know this story, because this is how it goes. At some point in that evening, I blacked out. I have absolutely no remembrance of what went on after a certain point. I didn't know what a blackout was for a long time. I just had these uh, peer, these blank spots. I <laughs> wasn't sure what happened. And uh, according to eyewitnesses at the house, I uh, came in the house and uh, standing in the living room and I started getting sick and, and I started running through the house and I'm getting sick through the living room, through the kitchen, through the family room. My grandfather sitting in the family room and he just explodes laughing because he knows what's going on. I go in the bathroom off the family room, hit everything in there but the toilet. And uh, the next thing that I remember is my mom you know, knocking on that bedroom door. Come out here, clean up this mess. You know, you've been drinking. Smells like a brewery out here. And, uh, you know, I remember opening up that bedroom door. She's still squawking in the hallway. You know, I was, I was always saying my, what well, later years would be my drinking uniform, my underwear. And, you know, I, I'd go in that bathroom. And and some significant things happened in this bathroom. I closed the door and I look into the mirror and this is what I said. Now, mind you, she's still screaming in the hallway. Man, oh, man, I cannot wait to do that again. I hear a lot of people and, and I've known a lot of people who had an experience like this with alcohol who stopped drinking. They did not drink anymore. I drank with guys in high school who got in trouble one time and stopped drinking. And to this day, have not drank again. And, and I'm in, now grounded for life was the punishment that had been decided upon in the living room, right, for this escapade. So I'm facing already negative consequences. Big book talk about a man put his hand on a hot stove. He don't do it again, right? I'm I'm the king of the hot stove. I'm in the bathroom. And this is the thought that comes to me. All right, Kent, uh, let's, let's take a look at this here. Okay, you got drunk. Yep. You got sick. Yep. You got grounded for life. Yep. All this is true. But Kent, what you have to realize is that the reason you got grounded for life is not because you got drunk. The reason you got grounded for life is because you got sick. So what you got to do is learn how to drink without getting sick. If anybody out there right now is listening to me and that made sense to you, you in a lot of trouble without step one, <laughs> I'm telling you. And and that's that that thinking, this this. This this belief that alcohol is an answer. Dr. Silkworth hit me between the eyes when my first sponsor took me to the doctor's opinion. He said we were restless, irritable and discontented until we could again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which came at once by taking a few drinks. My first sponsor said to me, do you realize when you are restless, irritable and discontented? It's not when you're drinking. He said they're describing your state sober, sober is the problem. That's the pro unbearable, untenable, unfathomable sobriety. 
I just can't, I can't envision life without this thing I found at 14 years old. And I'm telling you, I carried that in day A. Of course I did. I didn't walk into an AA meeting, get zapped by some lightning bolt, and all of a sudden the truth is revealed. No, no, that, it, and that's the story of my life for almost the next 20 years. I'm a consequences drinker. There's a lot of people who don't suffer a lot of consequences because if they're drinking, uh, I am not one of them. If I sat here right now and this was a drink of alcohol and I took a drink, a cop would fall out of the light behind me and <laughs> stand in the middle of my room. I'm one of them guys. When I came in AA, the old timers in Cleveland used to say, drink trouble, drink trouble. And I'm like, dude, I, if I don't get nothing else, I get that. Right. And, and so it just, it starts. And, and I infect the people in my house with this thing. I brought fear, anxiety, guilt, shame, remorse. I bought that into my mom and dad's house and I infected the people in my life with it until they were sicker than I was. Prior to me taking a drink of alcohol, there was no hollering and screaming in our house. There was nobody saying things like, we don't trust you anymore. You're not the son we raised. I can't wait till you get out of here. All of a sudden, see, that's what starts to happen. And and my mind, this, this obsessive thinking, it, it automatically will defend drinking. Alcohol is always the victor. It is never the problem. And I would fire back, you the problem, you did this, if this hadn't happened, if that hadn't happened. You know, it, it, the 12 steps obviously are an honesty-based program. The principle of step one is honesty, and every principle in the steps must be applied to the following steps. So the, you can't name me a step where the principle of honesty doesn't need to be applied. So that would then it would naturally follow because I'm a pretty simple guy that alcoholism is a lie based disease. You know, my first sponsor used to say I never walked into a bar room and said, bartender, give me a shot in the beer. I want to be in jail by nine o'clock. That that is not the way that I think. That is not the way that I think. It's always going to be different this time. <sighs> I'm looking for that eye. Right. And and it's so as I continued this drinking, the problems just keep mounting the problems at home, problems at school, eventually problems with the law, problems on the job. It just continues on and on and on and on. And, and I'm a guy who drinks alcohol to feel better about problems caused by drinking alcohol, right? I'm a guy who beats himself over the head with a hammer so he can't feel the ache like it says in the big book, right? And that's exactly how it was for me. So this just, it just goes on over the years. So Dr. Silkworth described something um, that had never before been presented to the world at large. And uh, he called it an allergy to alcohol, or uh, we call it the phenomenon of craving. When I drank, I knew as a teenager that I didn't drink like other people. I used to call them featherweights. I drank like a man. Y'all drink like little girls, right? I got cats in the car throwing up and, you know, throwing them in their front yard. And, you know, it just ha, ha, ha. And uh, I knew I didn't drink like other people. I just thought, and then I thought, you know, like a lot of people in my family, you know, they hit it pretty hard, you know, so we just, that's how we are. You know, we drink. I didn't understand that physically there's something different about me that does not occur. In nine out of 10 people who drink alcohol, that when I drink it, it sets up something, an insatiable, unquenchable thirst for more. I'm a guy who drinks until I run out of money. There's no liquor to be found or uh, bought or stole, or I get locked up. 
I, that's how I drink or I pass out. Right. And, and that happens uh, kind of frequently uh, as the years go on. But there's something physically different. Now, I didn't know that prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. These are things that I learned when I came to y'all. Right. So this, I got this allergy to the body. And now looking back over my experience, which is what we do here, you know, it's, it, it became obvious that, yes, I have that. Um, have always had it, had it from had it from the jump. Dr. Silkworth talked about this obsession of the mind. Um, and our book says that the problem with the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body, because if I don't take the first drink, I can't experience the phenomenon of craving. So what is it that the steps do for me? Right. They enable me through establishing, growing in a relationship with a power greater than myself. Uh, relief from the obsession to drink alcohol and that's what it does for me and so i got this obsession of the mind i I got this this thought that always occurs to me It, it just the book talks about the insidious insanity of alcoholism when my job when my freedom when my family and eventually when my life depend on me not drinking i drink uh, I had a heart attack and died in 1984. Um, obviously, I didn't stay dead, or you have a different speaker here this morning. But I had a heart attack and fell over in 1984. And they put me in the cardiac unit in the old Providence Hospital over here. And, uh, you know, I laid in there, you know, my mama crying. My older brother died at the age of 16. Um, she had already lost one. I'm laying up in here. Um, they saying it ain't looking good. I got tears rolling down the side of my eyes. I can still remember the look on my dad's face. See, this is this is the tornado roaring his way through the lives of others. And I laid there and I said, God, if you let me live, I'd never drink or do nothing else again. And I'm going to tell you all something right now. I meant it. I didn't want to die no more at the end than I do today. OK. I didn't want to. But that's human power. My want ain't enough. I spent 48 hours in the cardiac unit. They put me in a regular hospital room, um, said it was a medical miracle. The cardiologist said his his, uh, his heartbeat is strong as a horse. And um, I couldn't um, I couldn't believe it. Um, So I'm laying in this regular hospital room now. I am out of the cardiac unit. And uh, all of a sudden this thought occurs to me. And and if you're anything like me, you will recognize this thought. And here's the thought that occurred to me. Whew, that was close. Uh, But I'm all right now. This calls for a celebration. Guy comes in the room, my best drinking buddy. And uh, he is a guy who died of this disease when I was, I was seven years sober when, uh, when Mark died and he didn't desi- he Mark didn't die like indirectly as the result of the use of alcohol. Mark died directly as a result of the use of alcohol. And this man stood in front of me and I told him, um, you need to uh, go get me something to drink. And his response to me was, are you out of your mind? That's why you in here. In the first place, this is somebody who could see that who died of it. My response to him was, go do what I just told you to do. um, Because you're going to need me before I need you. And so that's what he did. And uh, two hours out of the cardiac unit, I was in the bathroom of that hospital chugging. It was a small liquor bull, tall boys in the cans. Um, I'm drunk two hours. I I didn't do that because I would rather be drunk than sober. I didn't do that because I would rather be dead than alive. I did that because I'm powerless over alcohol. And no human power could have relieved my alcoholism. So that's what uh, happened to me in 1984. I was going to court for my seventh DUI. and, um, and, And this was one where... I had uh, flipped the car over and they cut me out of the car with the jaws of life over here at the corner of Columbus Avenue and Taylor Street. 
And uh, they're talking about sending me away, which they should have. And uh, I was on my way to court. And here's the thought that occurred to me. Um, if you stay with me. Who you need to stop and have one before you go into court and just get that knot out of the back of your neck so you can breathe. Right. And I stopped off the Super Bowl Tavern and had two eight ounce water glasses. Of old granddad, that's a little more than have one. And uh, of course, and then I was arrested for being drunk in court. This I didn't want to go to prison no more then than I do today. When I said this has got to stop, how many times, how many Fridays get paid, leave work at 8 a.m., I work midnight, be broke by noon, one o'clock. I'm, that didn't happen to me for like, you know, three, four, five years. You're talking about 15 years in my life. And I used to lay in that room full of beer cans two feet deep. And I used to say, you know, I don't want to live like this. And next week, I'm going to get that paycheck. And I'm going to go home. And I'm going to take care of the stuff I need to do. I'm going to pay mom and dad the money I owe them. I'm going to pay my bills. I'm going to do, right? And then the next Friday would come. And that thing would go off in my head and it would say, well, you need to go down to the bar to cash your check. Guys like me don't know about banks and credit unions. And uh, go down to the bar and cash your check. And uh, and I go down to the bar to cash my check. It would say, well, you could have one beer before you go do all the stuff that you need to do because you have worked all week, which for me is usually about three days. Uh, you have worked all week and, and you deserve a beer. Right. At the end of my drinking, no baths, no showers, no. uh, I got a liver that's distended about seven inches, they said, when I got to the hospital. Um, Banned for life from my mom and dad's home. you know, like literally I live like an animal and and everybody don't have to go there. You know, you can get off the elevator at any floor. That's one of the things that we know here. Um, I said to my first sponsor, you know, I'm a, I'm a little upset that, you know, with all the trouble that I've been in, um, that nobody ever sent me to AA. They should have sent me to AA in the early eighties. Um, and he said to me, you got here when you were supposed to get here. And um, and so, you know, like I'm cool with that today. Um, if I'd have had one less, I might have never come. If I'd have had one more, it might have been too many. I don't know. But uh, I look back at that time at the end. Um, I'm really trying not to drink. Um I was very sick physically. I would drink. Some of y'all know um, about advanced stages of alcoholism, but I could drink, you know, half a can of beer and fall asleep. They used to have to call my little brother at, um, from bars and have him come and get me out of there because um, I'd be the head on the bar sleep. Um, just uh, so I come out of the pump lounge uh, out on Route 4. Uh, and it's a Thursday. It was a Wednesday night. It was a Wednesday night. And, uh, I had what they call a moment of clarity or a moment of sanity. Um, there was a guy in Cleveland, six pack Charlie, Charlie Kitchen. Charlie Kitchen died 62 years sober a couple of years ago. He's a great guy and a, a great speaker. Charlie used to say, that's the moment when God paralyzes the liar in you long enough for you to see the truth. And uh, what happened was um, I came out of that bar and I had that moment of clarity. My head cleared up um, and I could see it as clearly as I can now. And it, and it basically said, you have to stop drinking 
and you have to do it now because you're running out of time and you can't do it by yourself. So you got to get some help. A, a, a thought that had never occurred to me. No, I truly believe that it was the Sandusky City Police, the justice system, Ford Motor Company, my family, whoever, uh, the lady next door who called the police on me four or five times a week. It, it was it was always somebody or something else. You better get some help because you're running out of time. And I went home and uh, I called a guy who uh, was my best drinking buddy in college. And he's a, he's a doctor now. And he's a very, very powerful man. And, um, and I didn't know who else to call. Um, I called Rich. And uh, his wife answered the phone and she said, Richard, it's Kent. And that's exactly how she said it. And uh, he got on the phone and I said, Richard, I said, said, this your boy, man, I need some help. And he said to me, man, I've been waiting for this call for seven, eight years. He said, pack a bag, stay by the phone. I got you. And um, he called me back and he said, I'm going to put you in a place. He's in Cincinnati. That's where he's from. But he said, I'm going to put you in a place in Xenia, Ohio, which is right in between Dayton and Cincinnati, about 225 miles from where I live up here on Lake Erie. And he said, if I don't like what they do with you, I'm going to take you out of there and take you to a place in North Carolina. And he said, I'll take a leave of absence from work and I'll stay there with you till I can bring you back. I owed him all kinds of money. Um, he, Rich just loves me, I, you know. So when I get a call and I get a, I get my fair share, you know what I tell him? Pack a bag, stay by the phone. I got you. And for that, I am responsible. The next day, uh, I went to treatment, and um, I'm trying to go get some help, but I don't have, I, number one, I don't know what's wrong with me, and number two, I don't have no defense against the first drink. How could I? So I got a case of Genesee beer. I'm in the back seat of the car. My brother and his wife are in the front seat. They're going to drive me down to Centerville, Ohio, which is where Rich live, outside of Dayton, and uh I start drinking them cold beers back there. I didn't know too much about treatment, but I knew, you know, I figured there's a pretty good chance they wasn't serving no liquor down there. So I got this case and I got about three or four beers in me. And here's the thought that come to me. You know, I just may have overreacted here. I don't really think all this is necessary. So I said to my brother, man, I changed my mind, turn the car around. I, I'm not going down here. What I didn't know is that my father told my brother and his wife before they left, I give you $100, you don't bring that tramp back here. Now, this is a true story because my father knew. He knew. And so uh, my brother said, you got $200. I said, no. He said, then you're going to treatment. So they drove me on down here and we got to Rich's house and I was knee walking drunk. And uh, Rich, he, um, he cleaned me up a little bit. And uh, he put me in his car and he drove me down there. Uh, he bought me a quarter Miller's for the trip from uh, Centerville to Zenia. And we pulled in the parking lot of that hospital and he put that car in park and he looked at me and he said, go ahead, dog, finish that. And don't ask me how I know it. He said, that's the last beer you're ever going to drink. And that was May 17th of 1992. I have not had another drop of alcohol or anything else stronger than an aspirin since that day. And I ain't had too many aspirins, praise God. And um, the next day I woke up in detox. It was May 18th, 1992. That was to be my sobriety date. Um, I did not know that. I didn't know what a sobriety date was, nor did I care. And um, for the next 35 days uh, of that 28-day program, I... Uh, was on step one. 
And um, they told me, um, back in them days, the hospital treatment centers, they used to have, try to have you write a fourth and fifth step before you left treatment and all that. They said, we're not even going there with you. Um, step one and uh, 35 days. Um, a lot of things happened when I was there. I met y'all while I was there. Um, and um, I went to my first day meeting in detox pajamas. Um, and I listened to a woman who was from out of town and they said, anybody got anything, you know, they want to, a topic, anything they want to talk about. And the lady said she was from Indiana and she, she said something out loud. I wouldn't even admit to myself. And I thought to myself, they're going to ask her to leave. You can't come in here and say nothing like that. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> That's what I'm sitting up here thinking, right? And, and I saw the people in that room come alive. And I saw people share with that lady similar experiences they had had and the solutions that they had applied. I said, I loved AA from the first time I saw I thought, how could something like this exist? And I ain't never really heard of it. How could something like this exist? So I, I met the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. So after 35 days, they get ready to turn me loose. I had a counselor. His name was Jim D. Jim D said to me, uh, before I left, he said, listen, he said, if you don't go home, go to a meeting tonight, get a sponsor, get a home group and work these steps. Because that's what treatment was like back then. That's all they talked about. I don't know what they do now, but he said, you're going to die. He said, you are not the potential. You are the actual. And um, I kind of understood what what I read out of the big book. Um, When I read the big book, I thought somebody had been following me around. I ain't kidding you. I'm thinking this is a setup. So I came home and um, step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives had become unmanageable. I wasn't there yet. I didn't really understand that. Um, but he told me if I didn't go to meetings, I was going to die. I went to a meeting the first night I got home. And after that, I started going to three meetings Monday through Friday and four or five meetings on Saturday and Sunday. I lived in the rooms of everybody, of AA. Everybody knew me um, because I was untreated alcoholism, walking and talking. I was angry. I was vile and I was explosively violent. That's what I was when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. That didn't change by merely my presence being in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so I went to these meetings and I was very, very angry. I thought if I don't drink and go to these meetings, I will be okay. And uh, what I didn't understand is I didn't understand alcoholism. I didn't understand that spiritually, um, the restlessness, the irritability and the discontented, which fueled the obsession to drink was not treated. And um, 60 days sober, um, and going to eh, 20 some AA meetings a week. Uh, I picked up a T bar at work and I came up behind the supervisor and I was going to hit him in the head with it. And if I'd have hit him, I'd have killed him. And a guy saw me and ran and grabbed me and took that thing out of my hand. And um, he said, man, you got to get some help. And I'll, I'll tell you in truth, uh, I sponsor that guy today. <laughs> He's sober a long, long time. <laughs> he said, dude, you got, ain't, ain't you going to AA? He said, dude, you got to get some help. That's what I look like. 60 days sober, 20 some AA meetings a week. No sponsor, no steps, no home group, no nothing. Okay. I'm still thinking, listen, so, so, so Ken, if you went to all those meetings, why didn't you get a sponsor? You heard it. You hear it every day. People used to ask me, who's your sponsor? I would go into these meetings ranting and raving, and, and people said, Ken, who's your sponsor? I don't have, I don't need one. I can read. So why didn't I? I? I'll tell you why, and I bet you know, fear. I was afraid of being told no. I was afraid of having to do things that I didn't understand. I was. It's always fear. I, I could name you a bunch of other different stuff, but if you go to the root of it, it's fear of something, fear of what people going to think of me. I just. So 90 days, 
And I don't know, 250, 300 AA meetings I've been to. I'm sitting in the park parking lot of a bar, Daly's Pub in downtown Sandusky. And uh, I am sitting in the car with my hands on the steering wheel and I'm vibrating. I want to drink so bad. And, and I'm thinking to myself, what are you, some kind of freak? You go to all these meetings. You go to more meetings than anybody here. What's the matter with you? And I said my first prayer in that uh, in that car in, da- in the parking lot of Daly's Pub. And the prayer was this. God, what am I doing wrong? I ain't said a prayer yet. Three months. And uh, immediately what came to mind was, what are you doing right? You hear it every day. You're supposed to get a sponsor. You're supposed to read that book. You're supposed to apply them steps. You're supposed to get a home group. You're supposed to get a job at a home group. You're supposed to help other people. I ain't do none of that. I treated A like a cigarette smoking donut dunking coffee clutch. First one, last one at the meeting, the first one out of there after the Lord's Prayer. And that's what I, I wouldn't let. I would not have kept y'all at arm's length. I was not a part of, I was present. All these, all these are important things for me to remember today. Because it's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action. So uh, I turned the key and I went looking for a guy. Well, one or two guys. Um, Bill F. in uh, Lorraine, Ohio, Bill Finley or Kenny Bombalicki from Cleveland. They used to go to the Compass Group on Thursday nights. I liked the Compass Group. It was 700 people in a high school gymnasium and I could hide in there. And that's why I like the Compass Group. And um, and I went to the Compass Group and everybody, they, even the old timers here in Sandusky said, you know, those are some really good guys. They could help you, you know, and uh, <laughs> I scared them. You know, and I I said the first one of them I see when I walk into the Compass Group, I'm going to ask them to be my sponsor. And I walked in and, of course, they were sitting next to each other looking at me as I walked toward them. Kenny was laughing. And uh, (laughs) I just walked up and I said, would you guys help me? And uh, and that's how I got the help that I got. Kenny said to Bill, well, he's 25 miles from you and he's 45 miles from me. So you'll get the worst of it. And then I'll, he'll come to Cleveland and I'll clean up what's left. <laughs> that's how, and that's how I started with Bill and Kenny. And they took me through this book. And I'll tell you what, uh, doctor's opinion, Bill's story. There is a solution and more about alcoholism come to life. They had me tell them in my own personal experience how those things happen to me, that that obsession of the mind, especially that they talk about it more about alcoholism, not a cloud in the sky. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought occurred to me might be nice to have a couple of drinks, even though I just got out of the nut house for drinking. Dude, I, how, <laughs> I do this with the people that I sponsor. We, I, I don't tell them, go read something and then say, okay, let's go to the next step. We sit, knee to knee, and we talk about it. This is what they used to call sinking the hook out here, is to make step one real in my experience. The allergy of the body, the obsession of the mind, the state of restlessness, irritability, and discontentedness, sober. Dude, that's my life. So I truly believe that for me, step one began with some some information that I got at Green Hall during my 35 days there. And my counselor was a guy named Jim D, who is now sober 30, 45 years. And uh, he was one of them uh, AA fanatics in Southwest Ohio. I didn't know that he retired and moved to Florida now, but still, still boots on the ground sponsoring guys. He was a great guy. And and he got me to see some things. Um, he did the best he could with me in 35 days. And then I came home and took my 90-day sabbatical from following directions. 
And uh, <laughs> it, it was in that car. It was in that car in the parking lot of Daly's Pub that I fully conceded to my innermost self that I was alcoholic. It was in that car that step one became for me what Bill Wilson talked about in the 12 and 12 on the last page, that this thing had to be about life or death. And that a person who's who, who's not there is not going to be willing to take the actions that follow. It's about being willing to do anything necessary to recover from alcoholism. And I truly believe that. And it was a process that occurred, I believe, starting there with some information in Xenia and then through the experience of not doing what I was supposed to be doing. Um, I reached a point. It's a funny thing, like, you know, you, you come to all these AA meetings and um and you can't deny what you what you see. You can't deny what you hear. And and I don't know how many times I heard people stand up and tell my story. I don't know how many times I heard this is where I live at in Ohio. This is a big, big book area. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, ain't no book, you know, where they live or nothing out here. You can't even avoid it. You could you could find some out of the way little meetings where, you know, they don't want to talk about it. But ninety nine percent of the meetings where I go to around here, that book was on the table and people was telling you it's do or die, buddy. Right? And um, and my journey. Right. Has been that. So so it stays fresh with me. And I believe that it stays fresh with me. Um, I have not had the obsession to take a drink. Life has been life. Um, Barry White used to say there'd be days of joy and happiness, sadness and madness, the normal way of life. That has been my life. Right. There's been all ups, downs. There's been valleys. It's, it's you know, Ralph. No, he don't walk through valleys with me. Um, Ronnie. You know, Ronnie, you know, they, yeah, that's been my life. But I, I put my parents in the ground. It's been all kinds of things since I've been with y'all, you know, been money problems, been, you know, everything. Here's the thing. The thought of taking a drink has not occurred to me. Now, a lot of other crazy thoughts have occurred to me, some of which I will not share in this meeting, but... The thought of taking a drink has not occurred to me. And uh, my sponsor now, Bob D., you know, he's big on, you know, like Kent. You know, that's because you work so intensively with others. I sponsor sponsors in AA. I work intensively with other alcoholics. I sponsor a lot of people. And so this stuff just stays with me. And so while guys are sharing with me, of course, I'm sharing with them because that's what we're doing here. Right. We sit down knee to knee and, and it just it, it, it just continues to. I got I had a hunger for this. When I started working the steps, I had a hunger for this thing. I, I it, in my life, I ain't never finished nothing. I ain't never completed nothing. I ain't never been all in and committed to something and stayed with it. And I had a hunger for this thing when I came in here um, that. uh I still have to this day. And I believe what feeds it, what stokes that fire is working with others. I really do believe that. Step one is is the root of recovery for me. It's the root. The remaining 11 steps, I work imperfectly or practice imperfectly like anybody else. Uh We admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives had become unmanageable. Being convinced of that, as it says in ABCs, uh, we move on. Um, What I knew when I left that parking lot was if I didn't get some help, I was going to drink. If I don't get some help, I'm screwed because I'm powerless and I need some power. And that was the launching pad to step two. I want to thank you guys for listening, Ralph. I want to thank you, my brother, uh, for that invitation to participate in such a wonderful event. God bless and uh, everybody have a great.